Hi, uh, this is Dr. Hart, and uh, this is an introductory lecture called United States Congress. We're going to talk about the basics of the institution. So the eligibility to ser serve in Congress actually varies from house to house. In the U.S. House of Representatives, the minimum age is 25, and uh, you need to be a citizen for seven years. In the Senate, the minimum age is 30, and you need to be a citizen for five years. So an important point here is that a naturalized citizen can, in fact, be elected to Congress, either to the House of Representatives or to the Senate. You do not have to be a natural-born citizen. Now, the second point is that the House consists of 435 members. This has been the case for approximately a century now. The size of the House has not been expanded because members of Congress are very jealously guarding their own power, and so they do not want to expand their House. The size of the House, of course, is not established by the Constitution. It is controlled jointly by the House and the Senate, and so Congress hasn't actually increased its own size uh, in approximately a century. Each member represents exactly one district. This is by federal law. So we have a single-member district, simple plurality electoral system, which means that when you run for Congress, however many opponents you have, what matters is only one of you can actually get elected, single member, one per district. And all districts by law must have roughly the same number of people as per Supreme Court decision in the 1960s. So today, approximately 770,000 people are represented by each voting member of the House of Representatives. Uh, this is based on the calculation of the total population of the United States, which as of this recording is approximately 335 million people, divided by 435 voting members. So as you can tell, that's a lot of people uh, to, to represent for each member. And so each member has very little time for each individual citizen. Uh, now, in addition to 435 voting members, there are six non-voting members representing Washington, D.C., Puerto Rico, American Samoa, Guam, Northern Mariana Islands, and U.S. Virgin Islands. The Senate has 100 senators. The reason why is because the Constitution states that each state is to have exactly two senators, and there are currently 50 states, so 50 times 2 equals 100. Before 1913, senators were actually chosen by state legislatures, and of course, since then, they've been elected directly by the people in their respective states. Median age of the House members is currently uh, 58. So in the House of Representatives, people are quite old, but in the Senate, they're even older because the median age of senators is 63. One reason why this is happening, this demographic that is slanted toward the older generation, is because there are no term limits in Congress. And a representative or a senator who wants to serve endlessly may sometimes, if he or she is skilled enough to get reelected, turn it into a really long-term career. And there have been members and senators who served for several decades. So it's no wonder that some of them are quite old and they tend to skew the median toward a higher number. The median age of all Americans is 38. So you can tell that uh, members of Congress are a generation older than the average American. And... Members of the House serve two-year terms and can be re-elected indefinitely. Senators serve six-year terms, also can be re-elected indefinitely, as I stated. In the Senate, elections are staggered with approximately one-third of senators up for re-election every two years. In the House, the incumbency re-election rate is about 90%. This means that people who already serve in the House of Representatives, they are called incumbents. 
when they want to get reelected and run for office again, approximately 90% of them get reelected. In the Senate, the incumbency reelection rate is roughly 80%. Now, why do we have such high incumbency reelection rate? Well, clearly in the House of Representatives, what you find is the vast majority of districts are gerrymandered. Gerrymandering is a form of redistricting. Redistricting must happen uh, at least every 10 years when the new census is concluded, because as you will recall, each district must have roughly the same number of people living in it. And so as people obviously move between districts, that means that some districts gain population, some districts lose population, and districts are, every 10 years at least, being redrawn. Who are they redrawn by? Well, in the vast majority of states, they're actually redrawn by state legislatures and governor. So it's basically state law. So the state defines federal congressional districts. Now, the thing is that in many states, uh, you have very significant control by one party or another. For example, in California, you have very strong democratic control. Democrats have for years controlled both the Assembly and the Senate in California, and governor has been a d Democrat for a long time. So districts are drawn in such a way as to uh, make it very advantageous for Democrats and make it extremely difficult for Republicans to get elected. And a similar situation occurs in many other states. So all in all, when a typical congressional election comes around, what you find is approximately 40 to 50 House seats are truly competitive, where you don't know the result of the election beforehand. In all other cases, you can accurately predict the result of the election before the votes are even counted because those are safe districts. They're safe because they had been gerrymandered. So the term gerrymandering is a combination of two words, Jerry and salamander. Eldridge Jerry was governor of Massachusetts and salamander was the shape of the one of the districts that he and the state legislature actually drew. So gerrymandering is uh, Jerry and salamander. Gerrymandering is almost always lawful. The only time when it would not be lawful, would not be legal, is if you could prove that it was done in a way to intentionally disenfranchise a particular protected class, like a particular racial or ethnic group. But gerrymandering that is simply meant to give advantage to one party over another, that type of gerrymandering is legal. And uh, lastly, I want to say a few words about reapportionment. Like redistricting, reapportionment must happen every 10 years. Now, reapportionment happens because population changes not only between districts, but also between the states. We have 50 states and a highly mobile population, especially by world standards. And it's no secret that over the last half a century or so, there's been a definitive trend in the United States of southern and western uh, states growing much more rapidly in population than northeastern and midwestern states. In fact, some northeastern and midwestern states have lost population during the 21st century. So when the relative proportion of people living in each state changes, so must change the relative proportion of representatives that represents each state. And uh, what we have seen uh, in the 21st century is that states like Texas and Florida have gained uh, quite a few uh, number of representatives. Other states, like Michigan, they lost some. So uh, this is an inevitable part, reapportionment is an inevitable part of population shifts. And unlike uh, with redistricting and gerrymandering that accompanies it, there is no stigma uh, to reapportionment. This is just a, 
a very understandable and natural process of uh, population shifts. In the next video, we will uh, dive deeper into the demographics of uh, Congress of the United States.